Tonight, vaccine mandates are out for travelers and federal workers. We were cut off of everything. I've been waiting for something like this to happen. We hear from workers who've been off the job and some travelers who want the skies to stay vaccinated. You put not only the travelers at risk, you put our families at risk. Why this is happening now. Nearly a year after Lytton, B.C. burned to the ground, millions of dollars have been promised to rebuild Is It Enough. Why couldn't they have come up with announcement to help us out a long time ago? And the tiny island at the center of the decades-old dispute between Canada and Denmark. I think it was the friendliest of all wars. Why they hope Russia is watching. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away. A major shift is about to happen in this country's fight against COVID-19. Some of the federal government's key vaccine mandates are being suspended. That will mean soon unvaccinated travelers will be allowed to board planes again and some workers will be allowed back on the job. But as David Cochran shows us, that is not a full rollback of COVID measures and it might not be permanent either. At Canada's largest airport, opinions are mixed when it comes to vaccine mandates. When you lift the vaccine mandate, especially for travelers, you put not only the travelers at risk, you put our families at risk. As long as people are still required to wear masks, then, you know, we're in no different scenario than we are anywhere else in public space. So I'm okay with it. The mask mandate is staying. The vaccine mandate is not. On June 20th, our government will suspend the requirement to be vaccinated in order to board a plane or train in Canada. Gone, they say, because cases are low, vaccination rates high, and because the evolution of COVID meant a two-dose mandate made little sense. With Omicron, things changed. Vaccine efficacy waned. The longer you were from your vaccine, the less protection you had. And so a shift that doesn't apply just to travelers, but also to unvaccinated government workers. Employees who are on administrative leave without pay as a result of the vaccination policy will be contacted by their managers to resume regular duties with pay. I need my benefits back. I need uh, dental. I need medical. We, we were cut off of everything. Carl Kearley lost those benefits and his Coast Guard salary when he refused to get vaccinated. Since being forced on unpaid leave, he's been part of the protests against the federal mandates and burned through his retirement savings, hoping to get back to work. I still have some RSPs left, um, but I've been surviving on those right now and I've been waiting for something like this to happen. It's happened. The question is for how long. The mandates are only suspended not cancelled permanently. If the situation takes a turn for the worse, we are prepared to bring back the policies necessary to protect Canadians. David, let's hone in on that change for travellers. This is coming after weeks of those complaints about, you know, the long airport lines, the wait times. What are the chances this affects that? Well, you know, the government insists that this move is based solely on science and medical advice and has nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do with the long lines we're seeing at certain airports. The government blames those delays on a lack of staff and a surge in travel demand, and it says that ending these mandates is not going to end these problems. And, and in, if anything, Adrian, this could add to the congestion when people travel, because up until now, more than 3 million unvaccinated Canadians, they've not been flying. But starting Monday, they're free to buy a ticket and line up just like everybody else. All right, David Cochran in Ottawa, thank you. Thank you. So while we're talking about travel, here's a wrinkle. There's a program meant to go around airport security lines, but it has a long queue of its own, and that queue's getting longer. More than 333,000 Canadians applying for Nexus cards are waiting to be interviewed. And as Farah Morali shows us, this backlog cannot be blamed on COVID alone. Long lines and delays, the reality of travel through Canada's busiest airport these days. Having a Nexus card is one way to potentially bypass that. But if you're trying to apply or renew your card, good luck. There's frustration for a lot of people that have waited two years. Keith Lockman has been trying to renew his card and since 2020, but hasn't been able to book the required in-person interview. Canadian enrollment centres, closed because of COVID, still haven't reopened. 
you don't have any ability to contact anybody live to find out what's going on. And that's part of the frustration. We're coming up on close to 10 months now. So, and yeah, nothing's happened. He's not alone. Totally Mitchell Sauls' application is still pending I'm approval. I've called three times, spoken to somebody each time, and you know, they say that it's going to be delayed. You can travel to the U.S. for an interview, but there are a few slots. It stems from a much deeper, more complicated, challenging issue. This cross-border lawyer says as pandemic restrictions ease, the ongoing closures have to do with unresolved issues related to a 2019 agreement between both countries that allows U.S. pre-clearance officers in Canada to be armed. There are some complexities and challenges in that issue, so an officer from another country would have the ability to carry a weapon here and then use the weapon, and then what would happen? In a statement, the CBSA didn't respond to that directly, only saying Nexus is a joint program managed by both the CBSA and the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. It added Canada and the U.S. are in discussions about the timing of the reopening of Canadian enrollment centres. When you hear 300,000 is the backlog, you wonder how long it's going to take. Meanwhile, the waiting game continues for Lockman. He says the soonest he can get an interview on the U.S. side is now October. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. We are getting details today about an incident that happened at Toronto's Pearson Airport in March of 2020, where two planes were at risk of colliding. Now, according to a Transportation Safety Board report, the first plane carrying 87 people was accelerating for takeoff when it struck a bird. It radioed in that it was rejecting the takeoff, but neither air traffic control nor the plane behind it heard it. That second plane carrying 359 people accelerated for takeoff until the crew saw the first one still on the runway. Mercifully, no one was hurt, but the report found that the first plane's transponder showed it was in the air after its aborted takeoff, preventing a safety net system from alerting air traffic controllers to the problem. CBC News has learned that Toronto's interim police chief is expected to apologize tomorrow for how his force has treated the city's black communities. Thomas Degla explains what's prompting it. It's not known what words he'll use, but Toronto's interim police chief is set to apologize to the city's black community as the force reveals findings that are expected to be damning. I'm not sure that an apology by Jim Drimmer is going to go far enough. For the first time, the Toronto Police Service will release data showing how a person's race made officers more likely to use force or strip search them. The province mandated police gather the data. The figures were collected in 2020 as the U.S. police murder of George Floyd led to calls for rethinking or defunding law enforcement. They're not doing this voluntarily, so what else are they not telling us? Criticized for years over their long-held practice of carding, arbitrarily stopping mainly black men, Toronto police say they've been on a journey of transformation, acknowledging systemic discrimination can create or perpetuate disadvantage for racialized persons. We run into a lot of resistance and uh, a lot of skepticism, and I think that's, you know, pretty dehumanizing. In 2018, the Ontario Human Rights Commission found a black person in Toronto was nearly 20 times more likely than a white person to be shot and killed by police. With the apology and the release of the new data, the police service is also said to announce how it plans to address its failures, some of which have been known for years. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. It's been almost a year since Lytton, B.C. burned from a raging wildfire, and there's growing frustration over how little has been rebuilt. Today, Ottawa pledged millions to help that effort. Susanna De Silva was there to hear the reaction. I'm a resident here, and I lost my house down the end of the street. A tour that brings back painful memories with full safety gear required, not because of construction, but a cleanup process that continues one year later. Many lots frozen in time, still looking as they did moments after fire ripped through here. We'll be here for the people of Lytton to respond, to rebuild and to recover. A new government announcement is supposed to help change that. 77 million in federal funding, mostly toward new public buildings and to help homeowners build fire-resilient homes and some for businesses. 
know, we'd like to be able to snap a finger, move, uh, move by tomorrow. But as you know, the challenges with uh, the insured places of not having that cleanup uh, also uh, puts impediments. So there's a lot of other challenges that comes into place here. But some of the residents eager to hear the news worry that just means more excuses and delays. It's been a year later. It just seems like, you know, why couldn't they have come up with announcement to help us out a long time ago? My policy is no longer enough to rebuild, so I, I won't have a business, so this funding may not even affect us. We're trying to make it fire smart as we can. For um, Tricia Thorpe and her look, husband outside no of the downtown core, the rebuild okay. has begun, thanks to the help of fundraisers and volunteers. Well, it's still under construction. But most basic needs, like groceries, are an hour away. His heart attack in April, another frightening reminder of what the fire took, the ambulance station and emergency medical centre. Me on the phone telling Lillouette that we were coming and then phoning 911 and telling the ambulance that we would meet them because an ambulance can take an hour and a half, two hours here. And if we'd have waited for that ambulance, he wouldn't be here. Uh, you know, when Trish was taking me, I had three little heart attacks on the way up there. and it, it, it was very detached. It was like I was looking at myself and like I told Trish, I'm not afraid of dying. It's just I didn't want to die before the place was finished. So Susanna, this, this is so hard for these people and, and one very long year for them. But, but what's your sense of what happens now? Well, the federal government is promising that that money will be made available quickly. Now, the mayor says that by the end of September, they want this to be all cleaned up so that the rebuild process can actually begin. But he made comparisons to other cities that have seen fires in the United States and in Canada and says it's about a four to eight year process. And that's something for residents who they say it is simply too long, especially considering some have already decided the delays until now are too long and they're not coming back. Adrian. All right, Susanna Da Silva in Lytton. Thank you. Hundreds of Torontonians, dozens of families, are looking for answers after being ordered out of a public housing complex. Inspectors say the Swansea Muse has serious structural issues. One person has already been hurt by falling concrete. Philippe de Montigny has the story and what comes next. When you enter my uni, mm -hmm. You will see a uh, shorting. Helena Zendrai shows us inside her Swansea Muse apartment. Just weeks ago, two doors down, part of a bedroom ceiling collapsed and seriously injured a woman. These supports have now been set up in every room. How can I explain to my five years old? He cannot sit at the table and eat normally like any other children. But they're not enough to keep tenants safe. We've heard not only from the city, but from the third party consultants that they've never seen anything like this. The concrete slabs used to build the subsidized complex pose a significant risk to tenants, leading the city and Toronto Community Housing, which owns and operates Swansea, to issue this immediate order, essentially forcing people to move out. I'm so tired. <laughs> Mentally and physically. I'm already drained. We haven't been sleeping for weeks. Toronto Community Housing is relocating tenants to nearby hotels and student dorms, providing those now without kitchens with vouchers and gift cards for food. But many say they still feel in the dark. We're being told that we're ungrateful when all we want is answers. We don't know where we're going. They don't have any answers for where we're going. We have small children. We need proper place. We're willing to temporarily go to another unit and then come back after you tear this down and build it back up again. City officials say they've secured temporary accommodation for Swansea's roughly 420 permanent residents. The housing agency held a town hall meeting here at Humber College meant for tenants only. It was closed off to the media, but residents inside tell me tensions were high and many of their questions left unanswered. Philippe de Montigny, CBC News, Toronto. Quebec's strict new French language law has some in Quebec worried. Today, the leaders of dozens of tech companies say it is a major threat to the province's economy. Alison Northcott explains. This Montreal biotech company hires scientists from around the world to develop cancer drugs. But its CEO worries Quebec's new language law, Bill 96, will make it harder to recruit. These phenomenal researchers who embrace coming to Quebec and everything about coming to Quebec, they can go anywhere. And 
we don't want to lose them. He's one of dozens of Quebec tech leaders who have signed a letter to Premier Francois Legault warning Bill 96 is threatening to do enormous damage to the province's economy. The bill aims to strengthen Quebec's French language legislation with more rules for businesses and limits on who can access services in English. Under the new law, immigrants will have to receive most government services in French after just six months in the province. We believe that they can't thrive uh, and shouldn't thrive in Montreal without um, an ability to comfortably communicate in French. Six months um, I think would be a challenge for the most linguistically um, you know, able person. With a global shortage of tech workers, the companies behind the letter want Quebec to pause the bill's implementation and ensure enough support to learn French. Giving folks that are these highly skilled workers that are, that are desired globally an opportunity to really adopt to, uh, to, to Quebec. This labour lawyer, who's not a signatory, has been fielding calls from clients in several sectors about the changes. The Charter of the French Language has existed for a long time in Quebec. Um, and they're probably already doing a lot of things that they need to be doing. If you do have things that are not available in French, start prioritizing that. But Siegel worries the additional rules will drive companies away. Without more certainty, we are almost certainly going to lose new businesses. The province says it will put in place new tools to help immigrants learn French and says some of the provisions of the law won't come into effect until next year. Allison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. The Ukrainian president has made more urgent appeals for weaponry as Russia's invasion claims ammunition, equipment and lives. But right there, he also thanked Prime Minister Justin Trudeau for the assistance Canada has given so far. Volodymyr Zelensky describes a battle of attrition in the east with Ukraine inflicting losses on Russian forces. But as Margaret Evans explains, this is coming at a terrible cost. Comfort is elusive in Ukraine. Battlefield losses piling up and Russia's bloody invasion as senseless as ever. Father Vasil Ivankyuk preaches to an almost empty church. Most of his parishioners have fled with the rest of Kramatorsk. But he is also chaplain to fighting men and women. They worry about the loss of friends, he says, brothers in arms. Usually they try to blame themselves for not saving them. Sometimes it is the comforter himself in need of solace. I'm losing friends too, he says. The fight for the Donbass gets uglier by the day. Ukrainian troops say they're running out of ammunition, able to lob one round for every 10 from the Russians. Ukrainian forces are under extreme pressure in the key city of Severodonetsk. Civilians in nearby towns are making desperate bids to escape. Kyiv says it's losing at least 100 Ukrainian soldiers every day. I think the actual figure is more. Reservist Gennady Yershov says he expects to be called up to the front line. I'm ready to do that. Just a bit difficult result, uh, weapon support and something like that. It is the cry of every soldier you meet, including this one, who nearly lost a leg fighting in the Donbass, now in a hospital far from the front. We can't reveal his identity. If Russian weapons hit 40 kilometers, then ours need to hit 60, he says. Comfort can still be found in unexpected places, sometimes in the arms of another. Here, members of Ukraine's 14th separate mechanized brigade pause to celebrate a double wedding. Christina and Volodymyr met in the army just two months ago. War is war, says Christina, but life goes on. It is, if you like, an act of defiance. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Kramatorsk. In the UK tonight, a dramatic twist in a controversial plan to deport asylum seekers. It's racist. It's disgusting. 
next why the flight was cancelled at the very last second and what it means for the people who were on board. After so many mass shootings in the U.S. and so many lives lost, Andrew looks at why gun control is such a challenge in that country. How is it possible that the gun lobby is still winning? And an entire home swept away in a flood emergency. That is insane. We are back in two. The National, voted Canada's best national newscast. That is insane. Look at that. This new video shows what the powerful Yellowstone River is capable of after some recent downpours. This house in Montana completely washed away yesterday. Heavy rains and melting mountain snowpacks have triggered some historic flooding across the region, and the river might not be done yet. It's still a wild river. It's a national treasure, you know, but it has a temper, too. Interestingly, the Yellowstone is the only major U.S. river without a dam, making it much harder to control during heavy rains and floods. It's already destroyed multiple homes and buildings and left visitors stranded inside Yellowstone National Park. But so far, no reports of injuries. There's a last-minute twist tonight in a dramatic fight over the rights of asylum seekers. The first flight in a government plan to deport some refugees from the UK to Rwanda has been grounded. Chris Brown has the details of the plan and the pushback. This was the flight no one wanted a seat on, the first planned trip under an incendiary new policy, where instead of giving asylum seekers a hearing in the UK, Boris Johnson's government is trying to send them to a processing centre in Rwanda, in East Africa instead. It's racist, it's disgusting, it's like um, a way of treating people which, which I think is really unjust. The policy is the Conservative government's attempt to deter migrants and smugglers from making the dangerous journey across the English Channel by boat, a trip 28,000 people tried last year. Tuesday alone, UK border authorities and lifeboats in Dover picked up more than 270 men, women and children, mostly from the Middle East. This is all wrong. This is all wrong. The UN's this top refugee deal. watchdog and Britain's leading clergy claim the policy is not just immoral, it's illegal. This is about people who have the right, a right established since the 1951 convention to seek asylum in the UK and to have their asylum uh, case processed and determined here. Rwanda will house the migrants until their refugee hearings as part of a $180 million deal with the UK. And while few critics dispute the social advances Rwanda has made since its notorious genocide almost 30 years ago, they say sending claimants there is still cruel. Once they get here, only to be have the door slammed in their face. Um, it's not going to deter people from coming here. Um, and it's really, it's a political point scoring game that we're seeing. That we are not going to be in any way uh, deterred. Johnson affirmed he's determined to see the deportations through. We have to interrupt the business model of the gangs. In the end, the plane did not take off. Last minute appeals to the European Court of Human Rights means the Rwanda scheme may be on hold until a judicial review next month. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. In the wake of the massacre at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, and fierce debate over gun control in that country, we look at a question many may be asking. How is it possible that the gun lobby is still winning? Andrew explores why gun rights are so entrenched in the U.S. Next. And later, after decades of fighting over a tiny Arctic island, Canada and Denmark made a deal. Why they hope Russia is watching. This week in Washington, we've seen something that is extremely rare, real optimism over a possible deal on gun control legislation in the U.S. Senate. I think that the framework is very encouraging. A strong, a meaningful, positive step in the right direction. I'm proud of the work we've done so far. But, there's always a but, it's important to note how tentative this is. Just a framework for legislation promising 
enhanced background checks for younger buyers of long guns, and federal backing for state laws that keep guns out of the hands of known high-risk people. Meanwhile, since the massacre at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, three weeks ago, there have been more than 50 mass shootings in the U.S., killing more than 60 people, injuring more than 200 in the U.S. That is what is now, unfortunately, routine. Gun control legislation is not. Andrew took a deep look at why that is, even after so much tragedy. There were 21 victims in the shooting rampage at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas. A day after, U.S. President Joe Biden said this. As a nation, we have to ask, when in God's name are we going to stand up to the gun lobby? And I remember being really struck by that. I mean, here was the President of the United States practically begging Americans to do something. And for many years, presidents have tried and failed. There is no conceivable excuse to delay this action one more day. We can't tolerate this anymore. These tragedies must end. So the question we've been asking is, how is it possible that the gun lobby is still winning? Now, when we say gun lobby, we should talk about what that actually means. The first group that everyone thinks about is the National Rifle Association. To secure the rights of our fellow citizens. I'm honored to be here with the wonderful patriots of the NRA. It is the largest and most influential gun rights group in the United States, but it's also been in decline. According to its tax filings, its membership revenue is down, it's being investigated for fraud, it filed unsuccessfully for bankruptcy, it's been plagued by infighting, and I was surprised to find out that it's not even close to being the biggest lobby group in the United States. Not even close. But it does spend its money very strategically, pouring millions of dollars into Congress directly. For example, Republican Senator from North Carolina, Richard Burr, has had support over the years from the NRA to the tune of $6 million US. And he's just one guy. Mitt Romney, Marco Rubio, Mitch McConnell, Ted Cruz, big name Republicans with a lot of sway, they've all benefited. Now, we have Jody Madeira joining us, who is an author, also a law professor at Indiana University. Hi, Jody. Hello. So what is the secret to the NRA's success? Like, is it just about money? Well, I think that's a very uh, complicated question, but I don't think money alone really explains it. And I mean, it really is across the board and it has a lot of power, I think, in terms of keeping politicians uh, very focused on gun rights. The NRA finds you know, weaknesses in, in states by investing in state legislatures, uh, investing in state races, uh, the NRA can have a voice that it really cannot have on the federal level, thus creating uh, the illusion that these majors are now part of a national firearms culture. So here's something that's really interesting. According to Pew Research, most Americans do support expanded background checks, increasing the gun purchase age, waiting periods, licenses, tracking, all of that stuff. But one thing the gun lobby has done to great effect is to frame the issue in absolute terms. They take your guns, they take your freedom. And have a look at this. On the NRA website, right at the bottom, they frame themselves as a civil rights organization, saying they are proud defenders of history's patriots and diligent protectors of the Second Amendment. The truth is, if you disarm your people, you put them in a vulnerable position. The United States is one of the only countries in the entire world to have enshrined gun rights in its constitution. There have been others, Bolivia, Costa Rica, Honduras, Nicaragua, Colombia, Liberia, in Africa, but they've all since rescinded that right. The only three countries to have kept it, the United States, Mexico, and Guatemala. Now, Robert Spitzer is someone that we knew we had to talk to because he has literally spent decades studying this very question of how the NRA and the gun lobby came to be as influential as it has. And, and Robert, it really is in the last several decades that the NRA itself took what you would call a sharp right turn. Yes, the organization was founded in 1871 and it was devoted to marksmanship shooting skills. But come the mid-1970s, 
a dissident group within the organization decided that it wasn't political enough, it wasn't pushing hard enough to defend gun rights, and it wasn't conservative enough. And, and how did that manifest? I mean, what, what did that actually look like? It began to endorse political candidates. It had never done that before. It contributed more and more money to political campaigns, and it began a systematic process of stoking its base, uh, sending it its base relentlessly apocalyptic and uh, dark messaging about how the government was going to come and take their guns away. And fear is a pretty good motivator in politics. We will not allow our Second Amendment rights to be taken away from us by a bunch of cheap politicians. From my cold, dead hands. And fast forward to 2022. I mean, how much bigger has the gun lobby gotten beyond the NRA itself? In a certain respect, the old NRA doesn't need to lead the parade anymore. So now we've really opened a can of worms because what it did take me a little while to realize is that we really do have to get away from this idea of thinking of the gun lobby as just one organization. It really is a rich mix of groups across a spectrum. If you pan around, I mean, this is not all whites out here, right? So yeah. how can it be a white nationalist rally? Now, I want to call up Dave Workman because he's with the Second Amendment Foundation, and that's a, a gun rights education, information, litigation, advocacy group uh, there in the United States. How are you doing? Well, I'm fine, Andrew. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Thanks for chatting with us. So, uh, you know, full disclosure, um, I'm not an American. I, I don't own a gun. And, you know, I think it would be, it's very tempting, too easy for me to, to generalize when I think about gun owners and gun rights advocates, you know, to think that these groups are all made up of, of the same sort of people who all want exactly the same sort of thing. Tell me otherwise. I mean, how do you, how do you see that? There are an estimated 100 million gun owners in the United States. They own somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 350 to 400 million firearms. But you have uh, the Second Amendment Foundation. We have 700,000 uh, approximate members uh, and supporters across the United States. We concentrate on education and most uh, definitely on litigation. Right now, uh, the foundation has somewhere uh, above 35 uh, court cases challenging state and local gun laws uh, to make sure that they are uh, constitutional. The Second Amendment, uh, we believe, is the one right that protects all the others. Do you not understand what the Second Amendment's about? We don't need gun control, we need demon control. Laws won't change evil. Evil doesn't obey laws. What they need to do is harden the schools and protect the kids. I did not kill a human being that day. I took out evil. Armed, law-abiding citizens. So to recap, the gun lobby wins because it's easier to resist change than to make it. It has money, connections. But most importantly, the gun lobby has managed to sow its ideology into the very foundational framework of the country itself. Guns aren't just guns. They're a symbol worth fighting for. And that symbolism alone is pretty politically useful. Take former U.S. President Donald Trump. Those clips of him you just saw were from the annual NRA convention held just days after the Uvalde, Texas shooting. Trump called it a heinous massacre, but then accused Democrats of using the tragedy to take away constitutional rights. Next, Newfoundland and Labrador confronts an uncertainty it has seen before. We found the solution after cod. What's the solution after oil? Well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? It is indeed. What could a pivot away from offshore oil mean for the province and its people? For the second time in a generation, Newfoundland and Labrador is embarking on a huge economic change, transitioning away from an industry that has sustained it Almost exactly 30 years ago, it was the northern cod fishery. Now, amid the push to slow global warming, it's offshore oil. David Cochran shows us what that will mean for the businesses and, crucially, the people who live there. Daybreak at the edge of Canada. 
an early start at the D.F. Burns Fabrication Shop in St. John's, where for 12 years, Sharon Whalen has been welding, mostly for offshore oil. I think it was a good career path that I chose, and the greatest day building in life is at home every night, you get uh, it's good money. She's from nearby Bell Island, where jobs are scarce. Oil gave her a chance to work close to home. A lot of people I went to high school with, they did move out west, but for the most part, if they're not working in trades, they're maybe not working. The people here will keep working thanks to the approval of the Beta Nord project a 200 million barrel oil field in the deep waters northeast of here. Ottawa approved it despite pressure from environmentalists. Some fear it could be the last oil project and that history is about to repeat itself. Growing up here in the 1980s, cod was king, but by 1992 the northern cod fishery had closed forever. The king was dead and the population of this province dropped by 10% over the next decade. Offshore oil put a floor under the population and the economy, but now that floor is starting to creak. The thought of a similar transition is enough to drive you to drink. So I sat down with Premier Andrew Fury to talk about it over a pint. The cod moratorium is directly responsible for the demographic shift in our communities today. So in the 70s, we had six kids for every senior. Now we have two seniors for every kid. That's that's just not sustainable. But how do you avoid a repeat of that with this transition? Well, I think we have the benefit, if you will, of having the bad experience from the cod moratorium to learn, to have lessons learned moving into this transition. Is Beta Nord the last project, though? No, I don't think so. I think Beta Nord is the new gold standard. But, you know, you're liberal, right? And, and you, you know, the liberal government claims to be a, a climate champion, and you saw the hit they took. Yep. I mean, do you think you'd be able to get another one through, Stephen Gobo, if he stays environment minister? It's responsible to be the new gold standard, and we should promote it as such. Uh, but I think that's why Newfoundland and Labrador's offshore is well positioned, because it can, there is more out there that is similar. Will it have to meet the rigorous environmental process? Absolutely, and it should. Right, so like in 92, it was like a light switch went off, right? You know, and the room just went dark. And, and this is more of a dimmer switch transition that, you know, the, the, the oil sector here will... Yeah, I don't see it as a dimmer. I see it as a changing one light to another. That light is in the process of being changed about 100 kilometers away at the Come By Chance oil refinery. This place closed in 2020 but its new owner, Berea, is trying to give it new life. So uh, how has the mood changed with your members, knowing that there's a, a second chance for this place? Uh, the mood changed uh, quite a bit because they had no future. Union President Glenn Nolan has been working with the company to build a new future, one built around biofuels. It's brought life back in to the workers. Uh, there's an opportunity now for uh, expansions. Uh, Brea has uh, talked to us about it and uh, they got plans and hopefully uh, we'll get a second phase, a third phase and keep going because renewable is the future and we're going to be the first of its kind to, to get on track with this. So it, it's a good news story in that sense. So this place didn't just refine oil, it refined Russian oil. Absolutely, it was different types of oil. It was sour crude, it was light crude. So it was different types of crude that they can get on the market, uh, local crude, whatever they get at a good price, and we'd uh, refine it. Once this conversion is complete, crude oil will be replaced with corn oil, cooking oil, and soybean oil to make renewable diesel and lower emission aviation fuel. It will be cleaner, but smaller, only about half the jobs they had in the past. It won't be the same numbers, and uh, you know, uh, that's the hard part. Uh, there will be people that uh, will not um, receive a job at first, but there is possibilities. The transition is less obvious in St. John's, where the signs of economic strain are easy to find, thanks to two years of COVID and a slowdown in the oil sector. The hope is Beta Nord provides another jolt, so the big supply ships can keep making their runs offshore and the last barrel of oil is a barrel of Newfoundland and Labrador oil. Back at the shop, company president Jason Fudge is preparing for life after that last barrel. Uh, 60 to 70% of the work we do in this shop right now is, is oil and gas. 
The story of D.F. Burns is the story of the provincial economy. Originally focusing on engines and parts for ships, then offshore oil. Now looking internationally and close to home for what's next. Obviously, we're going through an energy evolution, and uh, we recognize and, and, and support that. Newfoundland and Labrador relies a lot on its oil and gas industry. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it can't be overstated how important it is for us. We found the solution after cod. What's the solution after oil? Well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Do we know what that next industry is going to be beyond oil and gas? I'm not sure what that is yet, but we'll find an answer to that. And I don't think that that needs to be today, next week, next year, or a decade from now. It's the million dollar question for the half million people who live here. From an abrupt transition 30 years ago to a more gradual one, nearly 30 years from now. David Cochran, CBC News. St. John's. So you heard David mention there that the province's population has dwindled since the cod fishery closed from 580,000 people then to 510,000 now. There are more deaths every year than births. To help solve that problem, the Premier is hoping to recruit 5,000 immigrants a year by 2026. Up next, why Canada will soon have a new land border with Europe. You heard that. We'll explain right after the break. Canada is about to get a new land border with the European country. So this is part of a resolution of a half century old dispute over an Arctic island. And as Ashley Burke shows us, the deal is intended to send a message to one nation in particular. <laughs> A nearly 50-year conflict over this tiny island now resolved. Two friendly nations making peace at a time of war. Clearly what we're showing today is that um, you don't redraw boundaries on, through the barrel of a gun. Well, I hope that message will get to President Putin, although I'm not naive about what messages he takes. They've agreed to share Hans Island, a 1.3 square kilometer rock barren, icy, and smack dab in the middle of the waters between Canada and Greenland. This journalist, one of the few visitors that stepped foot there. Knowing that you are on top of a 50-year-old conflict uh, of international uh, magnitude is really odd because there's nothing. It's worthless. There's no minerals. There is no oil in the waters next to it. Worthless for some, but valuable to Inuit, who've hunted here for centuries long before the dispute between Canada and Denmark that came to be known as the Whiskey War. It was very convenient to have a completely insignificant Arctic sovereignty dispute with a NATO ally, which meant that they could travel to the island, raise their national flag, beat their chests about Arctic sovereignty and go home knowing that there was absolutely no chance of an escalation. The Canadian Armed Forces planted their flag and left behind Canadian whiskey. The Danish replaced it with schnapps, and on it went. And today, that war ended with an exchange of the final bottles. This agreement shows the rest of the world how to solve disputes in a peaceful manner and in respect of international law and order. The new border will follow this rift in the island, repairing a long-standing rift between two friendly countries and sending a message to a common foe. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Fantastic. Coming up, an Ottawa retirement home opens its doors to a family who fled the war in Ukraine. We had a space available and all the residents and staff really um, enjoyed getting ready for them to come. Their surprise welcome party next. You are looking at Ina Yermolenko and Boris Kudrykovsky. They fled Odessa with their daughter at the beginning of the war in Ukraine, not knowing where they would end up. Well, a retirement home in Ottawa had posted online offering a place to stay for a Ukrainian family, so they applied and they got it. And their new home is our moment. 
we just decided that we had one apartment ready to go. Everyone donated from the community, uh, furniture from residents, families, grocery stores. This was a great, great surprise. This was so touching. They prepared everything. They really wanted us to feel uh, like a home uh, here. Just speechless, a lot of tears, some pain inside and a lot of gratitude towards everybody. They're people just like me. We're all, we're all people and I'm glad we can help them out. We lost everything and we start from zero here. So this is a very, very, very big support for us. So Symphony Senior Living says that they are offering uh, this apartment free of charge for the first six months, but they really hope that the family is able to stay on with them after. That is the National for June the 14th. Good night.